Um, hello, uh, I'm Joel, um, Orchard and Grove. This is the name of our company that we could find that was the least Apple copyright infringing, uh, but still reminiscent of things you do with apples. Um, we thought it was clever, but it doesn't really age. Um, chief instigator, you have to come up with some sort of title, and I am a non-traditional programmer. I started off as a journalist, um, not quite like a real journalist like Peter is, uh, but less than that. Anyway, that's a longer story for beers. Um, and I was told I had to use anvil drops for every animation. Uh, so I've replaced every animation in these slides with anvil drops. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so there's four of us. We write exclusively Mac software. Uh, I feel a little bit in the minority here, uh, as I think there's a few of us that are on the Mac. Woo, Mac! Um, so if I misspeak about anything iOS related, and if I don't know what the hell a simulator is, um, that's, that's why. Uh, so we focus exclusively on the Mac. Uh, we have kind of a variety of, of applications, Anvil Drop. Um, they all kind of focus around authentication and identity management on the Mac, uh, typically with password synchronization to AD. Uh, the one at the top, and this is Carry the Caribou. Caribou are probably not prevalent in Australia. All right, so it's like a big it, moose? Deer. Uh, deer? Kangaroo with, kangaroo with horns. Yes, yes. A roo with horns is what it is. If I can't be educational, at least I can be entertaining. Um, so that is Carrie the caribou, named after Carrie Fisher. Uh, we found out later that female caribou actually have antlers, so it worked out well. Um, that we didn't have to come up with a more backstory there. Uh, so we've got a number of applications, and a lot of them deal with kind of very similar features around Active Directory integration. And we found that we were starting to copy over a lot of class files from one app to another, and it really became a pain in the ass very, very quickly. All right, because we were losing track of where everything was, we were versioning all of these different class files, and uh, it kind of went badly from there. Uh, this is what the app looks like. It's uh, nothing really exciting, except if you're an admin, and uh, ideally it keeps your keychain from getting messed up and keeps file vault and sync and stuff like that. Uh, ends up being a menu bar item. Um, for, for those of you that are interested, it does all kinds of crazy stuff with LDAP and looking up SRV records. Things you've probably never had to do on a phone, um, would be my guess. So we do a lot of this under the covers, and all of this was very common between all the apps. So we said, there's, there's got to be a good way of doing this, and this is where we started looking into native Swift frameworks. Um, who's written a framework? Who's written a framework natively in Swift? Well, that's good, because um, uh, that means that we don't just all go to the pub. I was, I was glad, but I had the safety slide in case everybody had already written one. Um, so we've written, I shouldn't say we, I've never written a line of Objective-C, but uh, our head of engineering has. And so he started off writing frameworks in, in Objective-C, and we said, no, that's not modern. That's a fighting word, I'm not, no, no, all right. So everybody agrees. So it doesn't seem like we're creating, we're creating tech debt by doing things in Objective-C, so we wanna do these in Swift. And so that's where we started doing it in Swift. Uh, and at first it seemed like it may be a very simple process. Uh, but then we found that there's a few kind of gotchas in this um, that if you don't know where to look, don't really seem documented, things that you need to keep in mind. All right, so our problem, we had all this commonality, uh, wanted to put it into one kind of code base. Uh, like I said, we were kind of looking around at sharing class files and stuff. None of that was very effective. And we had kind of another anvil drop. Um, do you know what this is? Yeah. What, what is it? Yes, and what animal does it look like? Kangaroos. Yes, so I had this argument with Tim, not the Tim you call Tom, <laughs> which I find weird, but the beardy Tim, uh, he was trying to tell me that wasn't a kangaroo, uh, but obviously marsupial, everything else. So that was just a, a cheap laugh for the home crowd. Um, our app is primarily open source. We think we probably have close to about a million Macs that are running this. Um, and we are hoping to kind of bridge the gap between this developer 
audience that we have here and kind of the admin audience that we normally work with. Uh, normally, I'm much more at home at X World. How many people have been to X World? I think there's one or two here. All right, obviously David. Um, you know, talking to a bunch of admins, trying to get them to get beyond from shell scripting into something a lot more real, you know, something that you can sign, something that's able to use APIs and things like that. And so one of the goals we had here is that trying to do all this Active Directory work gets really, really complicated. You do a lot of LDAP lookups, SRV records, and things like that. And it's rather daunting for a brand new programmer to just go from, hey, I just learned Swift, crap, now I gotta learn the resolver, I gotta learn callbacks, I gotta learn all this other stuff. So we did have kind of a, a softer reason for putting this into a framework is that we were hoping this could be used by other maybe more beginning programmers that wanted to kind of add Active Directory integration directly into their app without having to learn a whole bunch about it. So that's also what kind of drove us to doing a framework uh, as we went through there. And we thought, well, this would be really good. Uh, frameworks have been around on the Mac for a long time. They're fairly easy. You go to Project New, Cocoa Framework, Cocoa Touch Framework, and you create one. And so gratuitous, you watch with the anvil drops coming. And the goal would be that we would have uh, all of this, there's the anvil drop, and we'd have one framework that we could share between them all, and we'd have all that common code, life would be good, rainbows would appear and everything else. And so far, we've actually achieved some of that. Um, but again, you know, here we are to, to tell you about some of the issues that we ran into as we went through it. So to, to make a framework, you go into Xcode, you do a new project, you create a framework. Uh, don't pick Objective-C, that's, that's, that's old, pick Swift instead, and you get a nice Swift framework that you have out there, uh, and you're able to drop it around and you feel very smart and excited. A um, Couple of things that we've learned to keep in mind that make life a lot easier. Uh, first of all, use the inline documentation. Who actually uses this? All right, that's more surprising than I was expecting. Um, if you're creating a framework, you definitely want to do this because then the help when other people embed your framework in their app will actually show what your functions do. What a concept. You'll know what it comes back with, you'll know what it does, and it's very easy to document inline control command slash, right? So you can do this, you can add it as you go through. If you don't do that, you're not being very nice to the people that are following behind you, because it looks kind of something like this, so the quick help actually shows up, right? So very, very nice for anyone if you're trying to share this with other people that are out there. Access control, very, very important with a framework. If nothing in your framework is marked public, your framework is useless, <laughs> all right? Nothing will be exported to the app. Uh, you won't have an API, you'll have a piece of code that is useless. So make sure you mark things public. You also have to be a lot more careful here about making sure everything else is private. It's a little bit easier now. In early versions of Swift, everything was kind of thrown out there. Name collisions were crazy. You'd have all kinds of fun stuff. So now you explicitly mark some things public. All the rest of the access controls work as you'd expect. The file private, private, and everything else. So you can use that within your own framework as you want to. Just make sure that parts of it are public so that the users can actually get something out of it. So that's a big thumbs up uh, that you want to do that there. So we got past that part. We said it was pretty cool. Uh, but then we got into a few things that started really annoying the bejeebus out of us. Um, and this is where kind of the wheels went off. Um, so hopefully this is the wisdom that we can impart as we've gone down this path. Uh, and this is, uh, it's a, a drop bear, right? <laughs> is that, I, it was in Wikipedia, uh, must be real. Um, so those of you working on iOS don't have to worry about that as much. On the Mac, you have to include the Swift, sta Swift standard library with all of your binaries as you go through this, right? That's not an iOS thing, right? You do an iOS, you do an iOS as well. All right, so you end up with the same problem. So ignore that little <laughs> Mac OS thing in the top right-hand corner. All right, so your Swift standard binaries have to always be here. The pain in the butt about this is that when you send your framework out there, it's gonna have eight megs of the Swift runtime in it, which is gonna be embedded in an app that always so has eight megs of the Swift runtime in it. You can probably try to get clever and do some sim linking and stuff, but I think pain just lies down that path. All right, the good news is it compresses down really, really well. <laughs> the other good news is you're probably only adding one more Swift runtime library onto a disk that probably has 800 of them anyway. Uh, so you, you know, in the grand scheme of things, you don't feel like you're really doing that. If you don't embed the standard library, your framework won't work. 
All right. Specific to Swift frameworks, Objective C, you don't have to worry about that. Um, you want to mix in Objective C because maybe you think, well, hey, uh, we've got some code that's still in Objective C. We don't maybe have the luxury of rewriting that just yet. And so you want to put this in here. This gets also a little bit complicated, gratuitous anvil drop. Uh, at first you think, well, no big deal. We all know about bridging headers. We're just going to add that in and we're going to be done, right? Um, no bueno. Uh, you, get, you get the denied there. What you need to do is a module map. So a quick module map file will allow you to export any of your Objective-C back to the Swift that you have in the same framework that you have. It seems a little bit redundant, but it works. All right, so now your Swift can call your Objective-C. You can wrap any of your Objective-C parts in Swift and then expose that up. Uh, you do get some fun times trying to expose all the Objective-C back up through your framework because uh, your app won't read this module map. Does that make sense? But if you put a wrapper around it in Swift, then you're able to use it from there. So we use this module map, maps the header files. You just got to go into the build settings and make sure that you're importing this. Otherwise, the project won't find it. Your things won't compile. All right? So module map, import the module map, and then you import it into the class, and then you're able to actually use those Objective-C bits as you go through here. Not overly complicated, but I'm trying to find this anywhere in the documentation was a bit rough. Um, and so we spun our wheels for a while trying to do this. Um, if you want to use the Swift framework from Objective-C code, uh, just like you would with anything, you've got to mark it all with the Objective-C attribute. So it does this, you can have Objective-C being called by Swift and a framework that's then being called by Objective-C. And inception starts, the world stops spinning as fast, uh, life isn't as good. Um, you know, as with anything, don't get cute with names because uh, you are, some of your public APIs will go back up into your app. You want to make sure that you're not having any sort of name collisions or other things with functions that other users may be doing. Um, if you want multi-targets, you are able to have a framework that's, that's fat, uh, that has all of the iOS watch and everything else in it. Trying to mix iOS with Mac gets a little bit funky. Uh, there's a web page here that you can find out that you can go through and actually start doing a lot of breaking different pieces off into different folders within your framework. Um, it does get kind of laborious as you go through this, however. Um, and that you probably also run into, uh, although the gentleman from Alamo Fire has left us, uh, but they do a lot of work where it's a fat kind of framework with everything else in there. Uh, so you can ask him about some of that. Um, it does get kind of complicated because you got to if statement out a lot of stuff uh, as you move between the platforms as you go through there. But very feasible if that's what you're interested in. Um, then, then the things, this is uh, the, a bird that, that's not a very nice bird, right? Bin chicken. A bin chicken, yes. So this is kind of what I think of the swift bird a little bit uh, as we went through this, as we had some pretty significant annoyances gratuitous anvil drop. Um, all frameworks need to be compiled on the exact same version of your app, right? This is the difference from Objective-C. With Objective-C, you could compile in one version. I don't even know what a version of Objective-C is. Three? Is that a? Yes. Yes? All right, great. <laughs> and then put it into an app that was version four of Objective-C. That does not work with Swift. Part of this is because of the runtime libraries that you've got to have in here. Uh, so because of that, we ended up doing everything within workspaces. That's the simplest and the easiest way to work with Swift standard frameworks. All right, put it into a workspace so your framework is actually being built at the same time as your app, then everything will be on the same version of Swift. All right, life will be good. Uh, so you gotta learn to love frame, uh, uh, workspaces as you go through this. Uh-oh, I don't know what comes next. Oh, that's right, here we go. Once the ABI gets finalized, a lot of this will get much, much easier because you won't have to do all this recompilation. You won't have to worry about making sure that you're matching versions of Swift between the binaries of the framework and the binaries of your application as you go through there. So nothing huge, but just a couple of things that you got to keep in mind. Uh, I've got a demo that you can see. Uh, we put this project uh, online. So I've got a little framework in here. Uh, you're able to go through and take a look at it. Um, you can see how we're mixing some of the pieces. You can see my really, really ugly Objective C uh, that's in there. Uh, I don't, and yeah, see, I don't, I'm not entirely certain what that does, but it compiles. 
so ship it, right? <laughs> um, and then here we've got an app that we've put in here that we're actually importing the framework into. And then you can kind of see some of the idea of how to get to those function calls within the framework from the app that surrounds it. Using a frame or using a workspace is fun. The problem is we ran into, we had a single framework that was being used across a number of different applications. And a workspace will not allow you to have a project open in multiple workspaces at the same time. So now you have to almost do separate clones of your framework to put into the workspaces for the apps that you're working on. It's a pain. Hopefully that gets solved in a little bit as well. Again, with the ABI stability, you won't need to have it open all the time uh, so that you're compiling everything as you go through. Uh, so that's published um, on our GitLab repo because the fox is cooler than the octopus, right? This is, well, it kind of made sense, all right? The fox is cool. Uh, GitLab has been growing on us. We've been having a lot of fun. Uh, this is the framework that we actually made out of it, that steampunk carry. Uh, with gratuitous keynote animations. Uh, and if you're interested, it does all of your Active Directory uh, integration, uh, looks up site records, uh, follows all the uh, AD specs that you don't want to read because they're pretty old now. Um, modern API with callbacks, that was a lot of fun to actually do. And actually vends out a menu item so that you can just add it to an app, shows you when your password's going to expire and things like that. Um, entirely open source. Um, like I said, we probably got about a million Macs, we think. It's great because we're open source, we can make up any number we want, and uh, <laughs> nobody can prove us wrong. Uh, we know our largest customer has 40,000 Macs using it, and we've heard of a lot more that have almost that many as well. Um, so using a lot of the built-in APIs, and what we were excited to be able to do is we put a lot of things into one single framework um, that made us really happy, uh, fireworks uh, happened is we were able to integrate with a lot of the lower level pieces, the Kerberos, the LDAP. That's the open LDAP icon, uh, the silkworm, I believe. Uh, you wouldn't know that, because worms really don't have anything to do with open LDAP, but, and I think the O'Reilly book has some sort of other animal on it. Um, so anyway, so that's open LDAP. We were able to encapsulate all of this into one framework, and that framework, like I said, creates an NS menu item that we can just pick up and put into our other application. Uh, so it's really abstracted out a crap load of stuff that we would otherwise have to do by hand. And that is very much the beauty of the framework, is that you're able to do that and have that functionality. Uh, you can see a complete framework here. Um, that's on our GitLab page. And then we even have a sample app. So if you want to see what a Mac app looks like, right? Something new. Um, you'd be able to go there and look at that without any problems. A um, couple of notes about practical use. Uh, gratuitous anvil drop, anvil drop, anvil drop, anvil drop. Um, hopefully next year we're talking a lot more about Swift Package Manager. Because um, that would make a lot of this work with frameworks natively in Swift much, much easier. Um, we were hoping to maybe with WWDC we'd be close enough that we could start really doing some serious work with it now. We're not quite there yet. Um, and it seems like there's a fair amount of overhead still before we can truly use Swift Package Manager the way we'd like to. Um, personally, I would have been happy with something that was a little less advanced to come out first and then kind of grow from there, uh, but so it is. Um, we do uh, ship it with Carthage, uh, maybe another fighting words that we didn't like Cocoa Pods. Uh, we thought Cocoa Pods was a lot of overhead for us uh, plus would make it much harder for beginning admins that are getting into Swift development to add it in. Whereas Carthage makes this pretty simple. Uh, so we've got a Carthage cart file with it. So if you want to use that and add it to your projects, that way you can. Uh, but certainly for us internally, obviously we have the uh, ability to do that. We've put it all into a workspace. And we find that that's you know, the easiest so far, except for the fact that since we have about four or five different apps that depend on this one framework, we end up with about four or five different copies of the local Git clones of that framework so that we can use them with the workspaces as we go through. Um, the good news is we are not doing that much work on the framework anymore. So we're not, you know, we, we don't get into the trap of trying to update it from within the workspace and then push back to the single and then have to pull down on all the others. But if we do need to make some major changes, we can do that uh, with that. And this is the... Uh, URL for that framework. 
Um, that's posted, so you're more than welcome to go up there and grab that and take a quick look at things as well. Thank you.